All right, so we're back. Um, apologize that it took as long as it did for everybody to get their food, but she was going to have help and didn't have any help, so she did pretty good just to be one of her. So um, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed lunch, and uh, try your best to stay awake. Um, you know, do something, stay awake, right? But uh, it's good to be back, and we're going to get right into it because we're, we're against a little bit of time, and don't take that in rush. Um, we're going to go about what we've been doing, and we're going to finish it off, you know, and we'll have time to do what we got to do. So just, um, but we are against a little bit of time, so let me shut up and we'll get going here. Um, coming back to it, Brother Robbie Sipes, um, the son of Brother Brian Sipes, and the first time I ever heard... <laughs> Brother Brian, or not Brother Brian, but Brother Robbie. Robbie was preaching on a message. And he said something that hit me, and he may or may not remember it. He was talking about our carnal flesh. And uh, he used an analogy of someone having a garbage can, and in that garbage can were maggots. And he said, uh, would any of you ever dream of putting a collar around a maggot, bringing in and petting it, or something like that? And I thought, boy... He's right, down, he's right down the gun barrel. That's a little gross, but he's right because it is a reflection of our, what our works are about. And um, so, you know, he thought about the, the dirtiest thing you can think about is our flesh and how God sees sinful flesh. And he used that analogy, and it hit me. It was very practical, so I truly enjoyed Brother Robbie. As I always do when he teaches and preaches, I get something from it. He's very practical, so... Without uh, any further ado, we'll let Brother Robbie come up and put his heart monitors on and get started uh, in his message. I don't have pockets. Do they fit somewhere else? Oh, don't go right against your collar, brother. All right. <laughs> Do I need the other one? Yeah, you need both of them. I mean, but did, was there a, sec a third one? Uh, <laughs> Seemed like there was a third one. I think Brother David had one. <laughs> I don't it's, in the, it's in the pew behind your wife. Yeah, this is the one for NBC. <laughs> well, we don't need that one. Yeah. Run out of room, brother. Yeah. Let me see if I can. There you go. Stick it up here somewhere. Of course, Cam. She want to come dress in. <laughs> I feel like Joe Biden up here. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gonna tell me what to say? <laughs> I, did, I hope I didn't offend anybody with that. <laughs> All right. I was talking about the, the, the worms, the little white worms you find in trash cans at the bottom, when they, especially if you got meat in there. That's what, that was the worms. And so... You think, well, how did he think of something like that? Well, <clears throat> I'm a retired middle school teacher. So you have to say some things to get middle schoolers' attentions. And for little middle school boys, worms is one of them. So uh, anyway, glad to be here. Uh, appreciate the hospitality. I love the, the facilities here and uh, the lunch. And uh, I told Brother Donnie, I said, I... Uh, when, when we broke for lunch, he, I said, I'm glad that uh, you decide to wait because I didn't want to stand between this crowd and a hot dog. <laughs> but now I'm not so sure I won't be on the other side of that either because uh, you, you're liable to go to sleep. But uh, no, it was good and the, the preaching's been great. The fellowship's great and um, just uh, just real uh, uh, honored to be here. And um, we have a, a, a group we meet in Asheville. North Carolina in that area. That's actually Fairview. It's a little south of Asheville. Um, and so if you've got any, uh, anybody in that direction that would uh, like to come right now, we had been meeting on Sundays for years, and um, we found another group up there that uh, were rightly dividing, and they didn't have a teacher, but they had a place to meet. And we've been meeting in this uh, uh, couple's house, uh, David and Sherry Nesbitt, and 
they both have elderly parents and they're having to take care of them. And so it kind of worked out, but we met on Tuesdays because that's when the, we have the building. So uh, anyway, for, for now, that's what we're doing. But, um, uh, you know, just uh, keep us in your prayers. Um, where do we want to start today? Let's go. Let's start in Titus. Let's go to Titus chapter two. And I'm going to start my clock here so I'll know how long I've gone. <clears throat> I have since retired from the school system. I was a, a teacher for years and years, and then I became an administrator, and I uh, retired as a middle school principal. So um, when I got a chance to get out of that, I, I got out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, all right. Um, I want to look in Titus chapter two, and I want to particularly look at a, a, a couple verses here uh, that Paul talks about in, in Titus. Uh, look in verse eleven in Titus chapter two, verse eleven. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. In this present world and uh, this present world, of course, in Galatians chapter one, it's referred to as the this present evil world. And notice the contrast here of living soberly, righteously, godly, which is opposite of this present evil world. Um, as we do that, as we're taught to do that and we live soberly, righteously and godly, in this present world, we're to do that by following the direction in verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Speaking it, exhorting it, and rebuking those that teach op opposing to this, do it with all authority. We've got authority on the Word of God that we should be looking for this blessed hope. And that's what I want to talk about today is this hope. Um, uh, Brother Steve talked about it uh, last night about the uh, how that it, 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 it's, it's nothing new, but it seems like more and more there's even grace people are moving away from this hope um, and they're mixing in it with Israel's hope or uh, they're saying that there's just one uh, general resurrection and it's going to happen at the second coming and the church is going to go through the tribulation and, and all of this. But Paul instructs us to look for this hope. And this hope is, is not, a, it's not a, a side thing. It's not uh, something that's just a, a secondary. In fact, um, we're going to come back to Coloss or Titus, so you may want to hold there, but turn to Colossians and look in Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> In Colossians chapter 1, and notice in verse 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Uh, by the way, that reconciliation, our ministry here in the dispensation of grace, Paul refers to it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as the ministry of reconciliation. That's the word. That's the message that we have for the world, right? And ye, you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, made a minister. 
There's the, the hope. Our blessed hope is is part of the good news. Amen. It's not something secondary. It's not something that was just discovered in the 1800s by Schofield or whoever they say, you know, came up with this doctrine of the rapture of the church. This is the hope. This is the ultimate the ultimate of ultimate good news. This is what we're waiting for. Look, look back in Titus chapter 2. In verse 14, who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Here's a little uh, spoiler alert. You haven't been redeemed from all iniquity yet. You're still in a body of sin. You're still in a body of death. And Paul said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a promise. We have a hope of being delivered from this rotten, sinful flesh that we live in. The thing that causes us to, to, uh, to do that which we don't want to do, as Paul said in Romans chapter 7. And, and we're not able to do the things that we would want to do because we're in this body of sin but He gave Himself that He might redeem us from all iniquity. And we are looking for that. We are uh, groaning for that. We're, that. That is what we're looking for is this hope of one day being delivered. And uh, hold on to Titus again and, and turn over to um, Romans chapter 8. Look in Romans chapter 8. You know, the first thing, well, I'll tell you what, before we go to Romans chapter 8, we're going there, but turn to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, I got you holding a bunch of places, don't I? That's what them little things in your Bibles, the little ribbons, you can use those things. It's not tooth floss, right? Um, in Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Notice verse 12, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment that you believe, the moment that you put your faith and trust in the gospel of your salvation, the gospel that Jesus Christ went to a cross and He died for your sins and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. When you put your faith and trust in that, that very moment, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know why it's called the Holy, He's called the Holy Spirit of promise? Because, notice the next verse which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You're given the Holy Spirit a promise and that is the assurance. That is the down payment of the fact that you have a hope. If you don't have that Holy Spirit, you don't have that hope. But the Holy Spirit bears witness unto you through His Word, that you have that hope. He, he bears witness. Look over in Romans chapter 8. There's several things the, that uh, you get with the Holy Spirit, and of several of them are mentioned here in Romans chapter 8. Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If you're, you're led by Him, if you have his spirit in you. Back in verse 9, it says, But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And you have the spirit when you believe. And you receive that spirit. And, and he leads you and tells you. Notice verse, let's, let's continue reading verse 15. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It bears witness that you're a child of God. It tells you you're a child of God. And that is, of course, through His Word. He's not a still small voice in there talking to you. It's His Word. I know that I'm a child of God because the Bible says I'm a child of God. 
you put your faith in the word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And I am a child of God. Why? Because I've trusted Christ as my Savior. There was a time in my life when I trusted the gospel, believing that Christ died on the cross and was buried and rose again. And so he bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. Notice the next verse. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That's an heir. That's an inheritance that is eternal. Notice as we keep reading, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's some glory that's going to be revealed in us that the Holy Spirit leads us to have assurance of. It is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Notice this next term here that's used in verse 19. For the earnest expectation, earnest expectation, that's a earnestly looking forward to something, knowing and expecting it is going to happen. That's looking for. If you have an earnest expectation of something, you're looking for it. I know, uh, and uh, well, she's back there with the granddaughter, but she, I don't know if that speaker works in there or not, but my wife likes to order on Amazon. <laughs> right? So you get this little text, right? And that text says, your package will be delivered today. So what do you do? You start earnestly expecting the Amazon package, right? That's how we're supposed to be looking for the Lord. We're not going to have to look for uh, the, all the tribulation and trials that is, that's going to be poured out on this earth during the tribulation. Have you read Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7? You've re you read about those seals and those trumpets? The Bible says that w we've been saved from that. Amen. We've been delivered from the wrath to come. That wrath to come is throughout that time period there. Although, I mean, you know, it's, it's bad stuff. I don't want no part of that. And there's no comfort in that. There's no, th that's, we're not expecting that. That's not our earnest expectation. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are to expect that. Now, we don't know when it's going to be. And the reason you don't know, and if you hear a preacher telling you when it's going to happen, just chalk that one over to file 13. Because nobody's going to know. And... and the, the, the thing is, in fact, turn over to, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's move on down here in Romans and then we'll move. Um, no, notice verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Praise the Lord, we're going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. That's good news. You know, the gospel doesn't stop when you get saved. We're, going to, we're, we're saved now, but we're going to be supersized saved when that trumpet sounds and the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And we're going to be delivered from the bondage of this corruption. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. There's that earnest of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of of our bodies, for we're saved by hope. Now that, that term there and that, that terminology in verse 24, saved by hope, that's not soul salvation saved by hope. That's, this hope saves us from despair. It saves us from uh, uh, the groaning and the, the corruption. That's why Paul said in chapter 7, O wretched man that I am. 
who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ we have a Savior who's going to deliver us. In Galatians chapter 1, he talks about that he gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the signs of when the, who the Antichrist is going to be. You know, I'm not going to have to worry about that. We, and notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Our hope is an earthly or is a heavenly hope. That's where the Bible says that uh, our conversation, Philippians, our conversation is in heaven. That's where we're currently seated, right? When you, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, in all points of spiritual aspects, you're not even here right now. Ephesians says we are seated together with Him in heavenly places. Amen. The Bible says that we were raised with Him. You know what? Other resurrections, when the Bible speaks of resurrections, and again, I'm getting my head of myself. When the Bible speaks of other resurrections, those people are dead and they're going to come out of the graves. Do you know you've already had your resurrection, spiritually speaking? You're already raised with Him. You were crucified with Him. You were buried with Him. And you're raised with Him. What we're waiting for is the culmination of that with the physical. Right? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Notice, uh, I'm just going to jump in here because I don't have time, but notice verse 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. There's a difference between heaven and earth. And, uh, and again, don't have time to get into it, but if you go to Ephesians chapter 1, he's going to put gather together all things that are in heaven and all things that are in earth and going to bring them and bring them together in Christ. But they're different places. And there's earthly and there's heavenly. Notice verse 49. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of of the heavenly. It's not heavenly. I know my little granddaughter looks heavenly, but she's not. She's, we bear the image of the earthy now. But there's, there's more. Look at this, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Paul's showing you something different here. Yeah. A mystery. When Paul talks about a mystery, it's not something mysterious of, you know, magical like a, that. It is something that was not known that is being revealed. Amen. It's something that, was, that has just recently been revealed and this was something revealed to Paul. And it was that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is, this is new information because every resurrection that's in your Bible, other than what Paul is talking about right here, is the dead being raised. Not anyone alive on planet Earth. Uh, in fact, let's just look at a couple. Hold on to 1 Corinthians. And um, uh, uh, let's look in Job. Go to Job 19. The, the idea of resurrection itself is, is not a, a new concept. It's not wasn't a mystery. Um, in Job chapter 19, which, you know, I don't know... Uh, a whole lot about when Bible or when uh, books of the Bible were written. Uh, I, I, you can get, you can get an idea sometimes in the context, but other times, you know, you just kind of look at what some guy said, a historian says, which you can or cannot be right. But from what they say, Job was like the oldest book in in the Bible, right? I don't know that that's true, but that's what 
that's what some people say. So, but anyway, notice in Job 19 and verse 25. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall, shall I see God. Was Job expecting a resurrection? Yep. Yeah, what had to happen before that resurrection? Worms had to eat his body, right? That's the, also the case in, um, uh, look in John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and, some, and shall come forth. They that have done good unto resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, the damnation, of damnation. There, there, there's resurrection. And it's those that have died. Paul says, I'm showing you something different. First off, I'm showing you that you have a heavenly body that you're going to be resurrected to, bear the image of the heavenly. Secondly, notice and back in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, we shall not all sleep. Paul uses a personal pronoun there, we. Look over in 1 Thessalonians. We'll look at the other account of this. In 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4. Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have... No hope. Do you know what, how we're saved by hope? We don't have to sorrow like everybody else does. If you hear tell that I have passed away, you shouldn't sorrow for... Uh, you may not sorrow at all, but you shouldn't sorrow like those that don't have any hope. If you've got hope, then you know that you're, that you're going to see them again. In fact, that's what this whole passage is about. It's hope. If we believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's great comfort. Now, I want to ask you something. If you know that if the only way you're going to be part of this group that makes it to this and be part of the we, you're going to have to go through the wrath of God in the tribulation period, is that very much comfort? That's not comforting at all. I'd be like, Lord, take me out before all that. But that's what's being taught. Paul says we. Now I understand at 2 Timothy chapter 4, he, Paul, I believe, understood that this thing was going to last a little longer than maybe what he thought it was. But this is Paul. Right? I mean, he wrote down things by inspiration of God, but yet he's still a man. You know, he's still a man who had thoughts of... So, 
He says, we here, we which are alive and remain. And he was looking for that. And one day he's going to be brought with the Lord when this happens. You know, so many people get mixed up with the, the, the rapture of the church. And yes, I know the word rapture is not in the Bible. You know, that's the first thing they throw up to you, right? There's the word rapture. Well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the concept, the doctrine, you know what the, you know where the word rapture comes from? It comes from right here. Notice, look, look in verse, um, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's rapture. That's what the word rapture means. It's the catching up. It's the delivering up out from this present evil world. Is there any point in time in this passage of Scripture where the Lord comes down to earth? Where does He appear? In the clouds. All right, so, the, so the, the, the rapture of the church, the catching up of the church, whatever you want to call it, it takes place with the Lord appearing, right? He's going to appear in the clouds. This is a mystery. You know why? Because the time that we're in and what God is doing today is a mystery. It, the body of Christ is, was a mystery. And it began with Paul. It began and uh, uh, Turn over to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9... Verse 1, and Saul, who will become Paul, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The Lord appeared to Paul in the clouds and saved the He calls himself the chief of sinners and became a pattern to them that would hereafter believe on him to life everlasting right here. That's where the body of Christ, the first person baptized into one body by the Spirit is right here, I believe. Amen. I believe that it, is, it began with one man, Paul being saved on the road to Damascus with the Lord appearing. I believe the next time the Lord, right now the Bible says that He's seated at the right hand of the Father. The next time He gets up, He's going to come back into those clouds, the same place where He appeared to Paul, and He's going to take the body of Christ and we're going to be taken out of here. And it's a mystery. It's not part of Israel. It's not part of the second coming. It's not part of the, the, uh, the little flock. We don't, we don't have to, you know, Paul never gives us instructions on how to survive that seven years. You'd think the apostle of the Gentiles would give you some instruction. What, what are they to do? It doesn't even make sense. You, you realize that when the Lord begins His timetable back with the nation Israel again, there will be no need for the body of Christ to be on planet earth. The Bible says that we are, uh, that we're, we're, in fact, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And also go uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. That's what happens when you don't follow your notes. You end up taking lots of... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, let's go. Let's look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. There we have that ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are the ministers of reconciliation. We are His ambassadors. You know what? Ambassadors, they're always in foreign countries representing their home government. They're not, that's not their home. That's not where they're from. They're representing the government of their home country. We are representing the Lord Jesus Christ and His dispensation and dispensing of grace on planet earth right now. Amen. That's why we're here. That's the only reason we're here. Amen. God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we're here. Amen. It, you know, there's a lot of other things we can be doing, but that's, that's why God has His ambassadors here right now, is that word of reconciliation. And so we, He says here, uh, it, it's interesting here that He uses... Um, what he says here, uh, we pray at the end of this, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are in Christ's stead right now. Amen. We are the representative of Christ on planet earth at, during this dispensation of grace when the gospel of the grace of God is being proclaimed and the reconciliation that was provided on the cross. That's why we're here. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. I think somebody quoted this. Maybe Brother David quoted this. And my watch is telling me it's almost time to go. So uh, um, notice verse um, 11, just for time's sake. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Now that word perfecting, that means the maturing of, the growing up of. Being able to do the work, right? The work of the a work of the ministry. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Well, what is the work? What is the ministry? Ministry of reconciliation. We just read it, right? For what it, what is what does that do? What does that ministry do? For the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. The reason we're here is because God is. His saving people today to build a body of believers called the body of Christ, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. And we are, we are, as preachers and teachers, we perfect the saints so the saints can do the work of the ministry and that work of the ministry is the edifying of the body of Christ. It is the building up. Notice what it says here, verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God. Who's the we there? 13. Is that every person on, human, on planet earth? Well, look back in verse 12. What's the last word? Last three words. The body, the body of Christ. Till we, the body of Christ, all come in the unity of the faith. There are people out there today who will hear the gospel and will believe the gospel. And, when they, and God will save them when they hear that gospel and believe that gospel. We don't know who it is. We don't know who will believe and who won't believe. We don't know who has believed, to be honest with you, other than what people tell you. You can't look on... You know, somebody don't get an S put on their forehead when they get saved. That would be good, wouldn't it? That would be helpful. But no, we don't know. We don't know, but... Till we all come in the unity of the faith as the body of Christ into a complete... Well, let's just keep reading. He tells you right here. Let's read on. Let the Word of God say it. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. A perfect man has all of its body parts. A perfect man has, is complete. Ten fingers, ten toes, two ears, two eyes, a nose. We are to work that ministry until it's a complete man. Till it's full. And we are to help those that are saved. Read on down here. 
14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part Making, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What our job is as members of the body of Christ is to preach the gospel, get the gospel out so people can be saved. And then once they're saved or if they're saved, to help them come into the knowledge of the truth so then they can share the gospel, so that they can get other people saved, so that the body of Christ will continue to grow until it's full. It's the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. And when that takes place, there's no need for us to be on planet earth anymore. When the, when the tribulation starts, the, the gospel of the kingdom is going to kick back in full force. And I don't know how to preach that gospel. I wouldn't know how to preach that gospel. I don't know, do you, do you dunk them or do you just sprinkle them when they have to get baptized? I don't know. I'm not being equipped to do that. But those 144,000 sure will. There'll be people preaching that gospel, but it's not going to be the members of the body of Christ. Amen. We're going to be somewhere else. We don't have a need here anymore. And when that takes place, our vile bodies will be changed. But until then, we're to look for that. Um, I, I know it's time to go, but look, uh, look, uh, look in, take Colossians chapter 3, and then Philippians chapter 3, and then I'll, I'm going to be... I'm going to be done. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, that's where He's going to appear in the clouds, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. I like that word appear. That, what, that, what that means is you're going to be, one, one millisecond you're going to be standing on planet earth, and then one millisecond later you're going to appear with Him in glory. I mean, it's not a floating thing. It's not a hot air balloon ride. Nope, it is appearing with Him in glory. And we'll have, look at the, turn back a page to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be home then. For our conversation, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation has to do with where you call home. It is your address. It is where you actually have eternity. For example, when you go on a trip, I've used this analogy a lot, so if you've heard it, just ignore it. But if you go on a trip, if you go to, if you go to Paris, France, and you're staying at a particular hotel in Paris, France, and you're out on the street and somebody hears you talking, they know you're not from Paris. They know I'm not from Paris, right? So they ask me where I'm from. I don't say the Holiday Inn. That's not my home. That's where I'm from that day. But that's not my home. I live in Statesville. That's my home. That's where I call home. You're risen with Christ. You're seated together with Him in heavenly places. That's your home. That's where you're from. Not this earth. And so that's going to become a reality. Look in verse 21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like into his glorious body where according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You can't subdue your flesh. The best you can do is just kind of, just kind of hold it back a little bit. But you can't keep it from doing what it does. But one day it will be subdued. You'll have a body 
fashion like His glorious body. There won't be any pain. There won't be any arthritis. There won't be cancer. There won't be birth defects. There won't be violent crime. There won't be any of those things. There won't be death. It'll be life and it'll be eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my hope. That's my blessed hope. I pray that is your blessed hope. It is not, if it's not, Jesus Christ died so you could have that hope if you'll just put your faith and trust in what He did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Thank you, brother Robbie. All right, brother Ron, you ready? All right, brother. Get brother Brian up, and then after brother Brian, I'll go, and we'll be done. Is that all right? Everybody good? Or would y'all rather just hear Brian and we go? No, no. All right. Well, I had one fan out of the whole crowd, bro. <laughs> Must have been your wife. She wanted to hear me. Yeah. Is that all right? That's fine. All right. You buckle this one up. You, this right. is your Biden mic. That's what your son called it. And where's did. the teleprompter? <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother. Bro. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, I told him everything I knew. <laughs> That was a great message. Uh, he was using the scripture that I kept. I think, well, he's going to save one. But then he went and got in at Colossians. <laughs> I want you to turn. I want to read out of, uh, <clears throat> just go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I, I'm just going to jump right on in and y'all just hang on and, and ride the train, Okay. Uh, I want you to look in Ephesians chapter 2 and I want to talk to you about what a grace believer is. Uh, I don't usually do anything about the called grace movement. I, you know, we're not a movement. Uh, we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Uh, we're laborers with the Lord. We're ambassadors. And we labor with Him. We build in a building. God's building a building. He's not advancing a kingdom. And I want you to look in uh, number one. My number one point is in Ephesians chapter 2. A grace believer is someone that believes salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. Uh, you don't earn your salvation. You don't learn your way into salvation. God's Son did everything that needed to be done to save your soul. And that there's nothing you can do, but there is something you believe. And that's you believe the gospel of Christ. In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, notice in very familiar scripture, he said in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God took you plumb out of the picture in your salvation. And he goes on, he said, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look in Titus, Ch Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, notice what he says in verse 4. He said, "For I, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 6. People read verse 5, and, and it's true, but they never read verse 6, which He, Christ, shed on us. That word shed there, it has to do, He put it to your account what happened in verse 5. Now look at verse 5. He said, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You never had the Holy Spirit before you got saved to be renewed again in you. That verse is talking about Jesus Christ. And He shed the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He shed the washing of regeneration. Say, well, what Jesus Christ had... Listen, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. God's Son became what you are on that cross. You are a sinner. You were born in sin. You live a life of sin. And the Bible said there's none good. No. And he, I, Paul emphasized it when he said there's none good. It's like Paul thought, oh, I bet there's some going to say that. So I'm going to say, no, not one. Amen. I'm telling you, we need a Savior. And you couldn't have no works whatsoever to please God. What can you, as a sinner, as a rotten sinner, a stinking rotten sinner, what could you offer to a holy, righteous God to make God want to save you? Nothing. And these people are talking about keeping the law to be saved and to be righteous and you got to live it. You got to hang on, hold out, and hold dur and dur to the end. They've never been to the cross. The cross of Christ. And God, He hung on that cross. God made Him sin. And He said, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? God turned his back on his only son. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Jesus Christ never sinned. He was born of a virgin. He was holy. And he's the only man in the flesh as the son of man. He walked on this earth. And he's the only one that God the Father ever looked down and said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He was well pleased in his life. He was well pleased in his sacrifice and he died not his death, your death. The wages of sin is death. The payment of sin is death. And somebody had to die for your sins. You couldn't die for them because you're a sinner and your sins can't pay for sin. Uh, Jesus Christ was perfect and He died for them. And all you have to do is believe Him. And believe it for yourself. Believe that. And if you're not saved, you can be saved. There's no reason why anybody ought to walk out of this building lost right now. Everybody in here, if you'd say, I believe that with all of my heart, I believe it for myself. If you're not sure about your salvation, make it sure right now. Believe it for you. He died for me. Amen. And then go there and mark Matthew, I'm made of six. I trusted Christ's death on the cross, His burial, and His resurrection as my own. Amen. He's the sacrifice that God Almighty made for you. The Bible says in Romans 8 that God delivered him up for us all. God delivered him. That just overwhelms me. Do you know what grace is to me? The most precious thing to me. Grace to me is God saw how I would live after he saved me. God didn't look down and say, boy, old Brian's going to be a good and I'm going to get him. God, he's going to do this. He's going to... No, he'd look down and he'd say, Lord, he, he's going to fail me here. He's going to fail me there. He's not going to speak up here. Oh, he's going to let me down over here. His life is not going to be what it ought to be. But he saved me anyway. That's grace. <laughs> Brother, you can't live it to get it and you can't live it to keep it. Brother, we're in Christ. Thank God He don't see me in my flesh. I want you to look in Romans. Now I'm still talking about a grace believer now. 
These so-called grace believers that don't believe that, they don't understand grace. Say it's unmerited favor. It sure is. And it's like Brother Donnie said, it's not free. Look what the Son of God went through. And He was separated. you know He'd never been separated from the Father? You think about that. You think about that death that He went into. And that not, not the, just the physical death. Look with me in Hebrews 5 before we go over there. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get done here in the next 15 minutes. So y'all just hang on. In Hebrews chapter 5. Notice what he says. Notice he goes on. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. He's talk, you know, in the garden, the Bible said that he prayed until his sweat became as great drops of blood in agony. What's he praying? He said, Father, if it be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Not my will, but thy will be done. His will was not the drink of that cup, but he said, Father, your will be done. You know what was in that cup? That's the cup of the wrath of Almighty God against every sin that anybody on planet earth could ever do. All the crimes that you did against the Lord. All the breaking of the law. All of the sin that you could possibly do. Jesus Christ bore the wrath of Almighty God on him. Boy, God tore, poured his wrath out. He didn't want it that. And that death, I believe it's the separation. Death is the separation of spirit from the body. And I believe Jesus Christ separated, had to be separated from the Father to experience what a sinner would experience. Now he didn't taste, eat it of death. The Bible said he tasted the death for every man. And thank God that he just had to taste it. And when he tasted the death, God the Father said, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied with that salvation. I'm satisfied with what you've done in paying for all of their sin. And I can save them now. Uh, somebody had to die. Thank God for Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, there's something wrong with your liker. <laughs> Look on what he goes on in verse 8. He said that able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Jesus Christ feared that death. He's praying that God would save him from that death. Verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obeyed him. Verse 9, and being made perfect. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit through the resurrection out of that grave as Robbie was talking about. And Paul said in the verses down there where Robbie was reading that he was raised a quickening spirit as the head of the body of Christ. You know, to Israel, he was the son of man. He said, here, here's my nail. Touch him. Handle me. But you know, when Mary started to saw him, he said, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto the Father. And brother, I believe there was some captivity captive, and I believe he took us out of here. Do you know you were raised with him? You're seated with him? Now, come on, you either believe it or not. Do you believe on that cross you died with him? Your old man was crucified with him? You were buried with him, not for him, 
with Him. And you were raised with Him. And I'm seated with Him right now. And you know something? As far as God is concerned, my old man's dead. Now I have to reckon him to be dead. You know, you count it to be dead. My mama used that word all. That's a good English word, reckon. My mama said, I'd say, Mama, I'll do that. Well, I reckon. <laughs> reckon this, reckon that. But you have to reckon your old man to be dead. Folks, every once in a while he rises up, especially when you're in traffic. <laughs> It's hard to stay in the spirit like that. Boy, the only way you can walk holy in the spirit is stay home in your room. I want you to know grace believers believe salvation by grace. No works at all. Grace believers believe that they're complete in Christ and there's nothing that can make them any more complete. Now you think about it. What ordinance, what water baptism can't make you any more complete? Why the Bible says there's one baptism. That's what makes you complete. That completeness comes by being in Christ. I'm complete in Him. Look in Colossians chapter 2. Boy, I got about uh, a few more minutes. Look in Colossians chapter 2. In verse, notice what he says here. And I, I'm just going to just jump in there. Verse 10. Now I got to go back and read verse 8. Beware. And when Paul says beware, he means beware. Lest any man spoil you. You know what spoil is? Take you captive. Take the spoils of the war, the battle. He said, Let, uh, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ, for in Him. You see, man will try to get you to do the things in verse 8 to make you think you're walking holy with God. He'll try to put you under carnal ordinances and commandments to make you think that you're more holier than if anybody else don't do them things. Huh? And they feel more superior. I mean, there's people. I've been in there. I, there was a time that we didn't have a television. There was a time that June had to wear dresses all the time. There's nothing wrong in wearing a dress. There's nothing wrong in wearing... She probably got on blue jeans right now. But anyway, there's nothing wrong in that. But they got dress codes to put you under. They got all of these ordinances to put you under. And that's to control your life and to get you under their authority instead of the authority of the Word of God. Amen. Beware lest they spoil you through all of that mess. I mean, I thought it was a sin to blow your nose without a handkerchief at one time in my life. I mean... You had to carry it with you. You had to, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. I mean, we snuck one time off. Robbie probably remember this. We snuck off one time and went and watched a movie at a movie theater. And I was looking around hoping none of the Baptist people was there. Probably, and, and the thing about it is, probably the whole theater was filled with Baptists. <laughs> Down there in that city. But anyway, we're complete. He goes on. He said, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. Now, this, I love to take the words, uh, the, and I, I do this. Me and Sam talked about it. I like to see how the Holy Spirit takes that same word as complete and use it somewhere else. That teaches me something. But notice this. That word complete is translated filled up in Colossians 1, 24. When Paul fulfilled the word of God, he completed the word of God and the word that needed to be fit that gap, that interval between the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow is what's being 
filled up today and it's the mystery. And it's the body of Christ. And when Paul wrote those 13 epistles, he completed the word of God. And you're filled up. It means to end in Luke 7, 1. It means to perfect in Revelation 3, 2. It means accomplish in Luke 9. To be full in Philippians 4, 18. Fill up. You're full. You're complete. You are a finished product as far as God's concerned. A grace believer believes that then he believes the apostle of the Gentiles is the apostle of grace. Now, I'm not going to go through them, but you already heard some preachers talk about that you can go through every epistle of Paul and he wrote the salutation and it's grace and peace. But go through them and go to the end of it. He's the only one that ended his epistles, every one in grace. Paul is the apostle of to the Gentiles. He's the apostle of grace. Amen. Now people say, well, there's been grace in all the dispensation. There is a difference in having grace in a dispensation and being in the dispensation of grace. Amen. Where God is dealing with man through grace today and not in wrath or he doesn't see your sins. He sees the world under the blood of the cross. Amen. Now one day he's coming down and we're going to be out of here and then, brother, he's going to speak to this world in wrath. He's lost every epistle from start to finish is grace with Paul. And then grace and love motivates us as Paul. A grace believer is motivated by the grace of God. Let me give you that and I'm going to close. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm doing pretty good then. I'm about to get you back on track here. I look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Grace. Notice what he says here in, in verse 7. I'm just going to jump in there. Verse 15, verse 7. After that he was seen of James and then of all the epistles. And last of all. And you ought to underline it. Last of all. There's been no more revelation. Jesus Christ has not appeared to anybody. Paul was the last. And he said, last of all. He was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Then am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He never got over that. And how could you? But God did something. Look here, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I can say that today. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I might not be the, I'm probably the sorriest preacher there's walked this planet. I know I can't preach. I know people, they say you get too loud. You get too this, you get that, you get too excited. Well, this is an exciting message to me. I mean, you could go to a ball game and you can watch a guy come down the sidelines when on your team and he's carrying the ball and, and the crowds are roaring and, and you jump up and woohoo! Go, go. And then you come to church and you hear what Jesus did and you sit on a log like a frog on a log and won't even bur chirp or whatever a frog does. <laughs> I think the grace of God should motivate us. He saved you. He gave you eternal life. He went through 
all that he went through physically and spiritually so he could give you his life. And we can't, we can't be thankful for it. We can't be motivated to tell other people about it. The greatest thing you've got is your testimony. And you can testify if you're saved to the grace of God in your life. He goes on, he said, and, by, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. He's saying all this in light of what He did to the people in that church, the church of God at Jerusalem, to that kingdom church. He, he had men put to death, women. He took, put them in prison. He had them stoned and beat and persecuted them. And He was, he was slaughtering them. And God appeared to him. You know, God could have just knocked him down and killed him right there. And they would have rejoiced probably. But God didn't. That's a chosen vessel and I'm going to save him by my grace. And I'm going to reveal to him that I'm going to save people just like him. And he's the pattern of salvation for them who should hereafter believe on him. Paul, he's a... Apostle of grace. And grace motivated. He said in verse 10 again, He said, It wasn't in vain. Bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. That's what motivated His work. That's why He was untiring. That's why He... I mean, think about, you read 2 Corinthians 11, you find out, I mean, every boat he got on saint. You wouldn't want to travel with Paul if he's going to sail somewhere. <laughs> That'd be the first I'd ask him. I said, Paul, we're going to be getting on the boat. <laughs> and if he says, yeah, we got to cross this sea, you better have something to float on. Because it's going down. He was beat, whipped, stoned, robbed, and caned. All he, he said, I bear in my, on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, I'm, I'm caught betwixt two, having the desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better. I can understand him saying that. Or to stay in the flesh. He said it's more needful for me to stay because of you. The grace of God. Is that what motivates you? Y'all got a good pastor here and, and, and Donnie's group and Donnie. That's what motivates them. Somebody said, told me one time, how long ago, said, oh, you just in the ministry for getting, to get rich. <laughs> I've been doing it for 50 years. and I ain't, Ask June how rich we are. <laughs> She's still waiting on a honeymoon. <laughs> no, my reward is going coming. <laughs> I think I forget the preacher preached it one day years ago. Sam probably remember it. Went around preached it. I heard him preach it at a camp in Mississippi. Payday Sunday. R.G. Ely. Well, payday is going to be someday. God never promised you to ride in a Cadillac. What if you didn't like a Cadillac? He didn't promise you all of the things that they say that give to me. But He promised you life. He said having food and raiment to be content. It's hard to do. Isn't it? You know, He told the disciples, take no thought for what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. He didn't tell you that. You better take thought today. Because there's a lot of stuff you don't want to eat out there that you can eat out there that'll hurt you. Amen. Amen. 
I'm, I'm on another subject here, Lauren. Come on. Come on. I quit. <laughs> If he ever gets over his shyness, he's going to be all right. Isn't he? <laughs> yeah. All right, he, he did get us back on time. So let's take, uh, take a little bit of a break. I know everybody's been sitting there for a bit. Stretch your legs. If you need to get something to drink, we'll come back, and uh, I'll make short go of what I've got to do, okay? How long will break? Uh, yeah, 10 to 15 minutes, yeah. Kim, do you need to change out the memory card?